Happens Research Cluster, in, um, which does co um, consist of myself, um, Vasily and uh, Strumpakos and um, Theo uh, Spiropoulos. Um, I would very much like to welcome this evening uh, Matt Clark and Ash Nehru of um, UVA, um, United Visual Artists. Um, just a brief thing about them. They were um, set up, well, they set themselves up most probably in 2003 and are thought to be, we hope, and we will see examples of um, some of the most progressive performance-based and um, innovative real-time immersive and responsive experiences and multidisciplinary art and design um, pieces of work um, around today at the moment. Um, they have a very long client list, which I think they're going to explore with us. So hopefully, um, we shall see some of that. Thank you very much. Hello. Okay, so yeah, thanks for the introduction. We're UVA, I'm Matt, and this is Ash. Um, I'm the art director at UVA. Uh, and Ash is the software director. I thought it was important for us both to be here because uh, there's a crossover of art and science and in our work and, and it's good to have uh, both, both perspectives on our work. Uh, so I guess we're gonna sort of take turns and uh, talk about different bits. Um, maybe Matt will do the starting bit and I'll take over from him as appropriate. Yep. Okay, so <coughs> as mentioned, we started in, in 2003. Uh, Ash, myself, and Chris, who isn't here, who, who's the third director of the company, um, had worked with each other on, on several projects, mainly in live performance video. Um, the first project I worked with Chris on was for Leftfield, where I s designed the stage set, and, and Chris helped me design the video content. Um, previ previously to this, uh, I was kind of working in graphic design, designing record sleeves, you know, books, um, magazines, etc. Um, when I got to work on this live show, I knew one of the band members, um, and he gave me the opportunity to work on this show. Uh, when in the audience, actually watching it happen, it just made me kind of realize that this is what I wanted to do. Um, it, it was, a, it was a, a great form of design, and, and, and one which um, uh, you, you can get the experiential f um, feedback, which you don't really get f from graphic design. <coughs> so, the projects that brought all three of us together was um, Massive Attack's 100th Window Tour um, in, in 2003. We proposed an idea to 3D the, 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 the main guy from Massive Attack that we wanted to design a show that was based on digital information and not your traditional kind of video backdrop that you see on most kind of tours. Um, this picture here is kind of the first point of inspiration for us. We wanted it, the, the visual backdrop to look like a kind of uh, an information board that you might see at a train station or at an airport. And we wanted to run real time um, information that was actually real and drawn from various resources on the day of the actual show. Do you want to talk a bit about this? Sure, so um, every show started differently. So wherever you were in the world, you'd get a little uh, digital readout, like a, like a clock almost, telling you where you were and in case you hadn't realized the date and th your current location. Uh, so it was just a way of making the show personalized to each place that you went to. Audiences really appreciated the fact that they were seeing something that was tailor-made for them. Um, the show itself went from, uh, the idea was to go from the smallest possible scale, uh, just the abstract things like numbers, bits, ones and zeros, uh, going up through things like chemical elements, this was the periodic table, um, to genetic codes, uh, this was a treatment where we took some video of a flower opening uh, and then mapped it using the actual genetic code of the very same flower or as close as we could get. Uh, although of course you couldn't necessarily tell by looking at the video that it was the right flower. Uh, we also then went up through things like uh, virus reports. So this is a list of the, the latest viruses that had been released into the wild that day. So often you'd have somebody whose computer had been 
taken down that day by a virus and they'd see it go up on the mm -hmm. screen, you'd get this big cheer. Um, we also would put in uh, news headlines from that day. Uh, everything was translated into local language, so this was in France. Um, uh, again, this is all put in through text files on the day of the show and rendered in real time. Uh, we had a lot of lo location information, so if you were playing in Paris, you'd have the names of the different neighborhoods uh, nearby, and again, that would get a great audience response. You'd see little po pockets of people cheering when they saw their kind of neighborhood printed. Uh, we also allowed people to email, uh, send in messages that were targeted to a specific show. So if you were going to see the show in in Spain, you know, in Madrid, you'd send you could send a message that would appear on the screen at that particular show. And you did get some really interesting things happen. We didn't actually censor it at all, which was uh, mm. an unusual step. So you did get some quite interesting language. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's worth pointing that um, w uh, Chris. Uh, Bird and, and myself, we, uh, I'm art direction, Chris is production, and we actually got Ash involved in this project um, because he writes the software, uh, and there was there was no kind of off the off the shelf solution to create a system that allowed us to kind of be that versatile and change the show content every single day. There was a bit of uh, political content. This is around the time that the Iraq War was um, about to start. Um, and uh, and it actually began while the tour was going on, so 3D was uh, quite anti, as uh, of course all of us were. Um, but we wanted a way of putting this forward without being prescriptive, i.e. saying war is bad. That was We tried to stay away from the war is bad message. Uh, and we found a way of doing it, but just using statistics that came up. Some of them were war-related, others were uh, weapons-related. We had a, a shopping list of um, how much it cost to buy each of the different weapons that were being used in the conflict. Uh, we also had a bunch of other interesting real-time statistics such as you know how many acres of pizza have been consumed in the last second, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, just, just to give you the sense that the show is taking place here and now, you're actually mm. looking at things that are changing right now, it's not just a piece of video. And it was a juxtaposition of ver really serious subjects against kind of quite mundane and banal uh, topics which made it kind of interesting. So here's a bit of a bit of context. I mean, it's you always it, there's always a bit of a, a jump that happens when you're working on a show like this because when you're close to it, you're sort of in a room working on a computer, and then you go to production rehearsal, and then when you actually go out to a real show and you see people in front of it, is when you realize what you've made. Uh, you don't really understand the show until you put thousands of people in front of it and yeah. hear their reactions, uh, and it is it is a real buzz. I mean, we had this just the other day. We've been working on uh, George Michael's show. Not quite as cool, but uh, you know, again, we were quite bored by the whole thing. And then when you actually get 20,000 people in front of the screen, you kind of you get this little shiver down your spine. It is really good fun. But it's, a, it's an interesting form of design in, in respect. But as I said, until you have the lighting in place, the performers, the whole band, the sound, you know, it's only then that you can you can make the kind of final judgments. And with this kind of work, it, it usually takes you know a good few shows before you actually start sculpting it into the kind of thing it needs to be. Um, and uh, I, I can't think of many other design forms like that. I mean, practices. Uh, so this is a shot of uh, our homebrew equipment that we used to actually make the to make that first show. Uh, this is a piece of software that we wrote ourselves. Well, I mainly I wrote. Um, to allow you to animate uh, modules of code that would produce output from text files. So everything in the show was was uh, was sequenced and scripted to go precisely with the music. It was all synchronized to the band's computers as well, so it all was in time. Uh, but, but you could I override that. Yeah. With, with and so you had this little this little box of, of with knobs and sliders to let you override and to change things and perform jam live. Because there'd be parts of songs which. Uh, they kind of just jam out, and the kind of the, the time code finishes, but they're, they're they're still playing. So you have to be prepared to kind of override it, as it were. So <coughs> what came out of that first project that we did as UVA uh, was was that previously uh, we kind of worked in this this formula. The art direction would come from one place and feed down to production and programming. It was quite linear in that respect. Yeah, and so, so generally the model is, that, you know, the art director says what he wants. The production runs around and tries to do that, and then the, and then the software companies produce software for the production companies. So generally you have 
one individual or group of people who handles art direction, then you have a raft of companies that do production and another bunch of, of companies that produce software. Whereas we try to integrate, all, we realize that when you integrate them all in the same place and they're all at the same level, i.e. any one of us could tell the other to piss off. Yeah. Um, so um, you, then, you then have a very interesting thing that happens uh, where they all become creative partners in the process. So an idea can come from any of those three points um, and can in fact fix constraints that other bits have brought in. So this is a good example. Um, the next tour we designed for Massive Attack, um, it, was a, it was a smaller uh, show. It was just a, number of, uh, a small number of festival dates. We didn't have the kind of budget or the time to do anything as spectacular as the first show. So we had to kind of think creatively on, on, on how we can create maximum impact with, with, um, with a smaller budget. And so we looked into designing a di display system using lights. And this was kind of four years ago now. And mm -hmm. it's, it's it's generally crazy. uncommon to kind of interface with traditional lighting technology in this way. Mm -hmm. But it's a really good example of how a production constraint, which was cost and time and weight and various, you couldn't fly things in, uh, from the ceiling, for instance, so you couldn't hang a big LED screen in the air, uh, actually led us to produce, uh, it, it came up with a set of constraints that could only be solved by the application of software. Mm -hmm. And then the art direction stepped in mm -hmm. to, to make that uh, necessity into a virtue, if you see what I mean. And you can see here, you can just barely read the <laughs> that it says age two or something like that. Yeah, two, yeah. But when it's animated, it's a lot, more, it's a lot clearer. But the, the, the canvas size is actually only eight pixels high, which um, you can see this heartbeat line. Also you can actually pull um, narrative and, and create animations on, 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 on this um, aspect ratio, but it, it's incredibly hard making animations at eight pixels high, believe me. Yeah. So this is led to the most recent tour we did for them, which we'll, uh, which we'll gloss over quickly. This is a much more sculptural affair where you have a hemispherical shell around the band with uh, an array of extremely bright LEDs. These are a lot brighter than the previous set. So you get really interesting atmospheric effects when you pump smoke through it. The idea was to create <coughs> a screen and, and try to make imagery from beams of light instead of just kind of flat planes of light, how we did previously. And you can see this technology here, when used in this kind of contrasted way, it, it really does pull out the beam. I think we've got a short video. Yeah. Thank you. So this is just in the production rehearsal where we set the screen up in a warehouse and then turn the smoke up to the max. So um, I just sort of show you a quick uh, screenshot of what the current generation of the software looks like um, that we use for all our shows. Um, 
it lets you simulate the stage and your LED screen, whatever your technology has to be in real time and 3D, so you can visualize how the show is going to look before you ever build your stage. The reason we do that is that uh, the stuff is quite expensive, uh, including the space that you put it in. So if you, uh, I mean, you're you know you're paying thousands of pounds a day once you set the stage up. Um, so you obviously want to limit the time that you spend playing around with different uh, different options when you've actually built your screen. And that's what this lets you do. It lets you see things from different angles and make creative decisions before you ever build your set. But it is the actual software that runs the show. So you kind of, while you're pre-visualizing, you're actually making the show. Um, that's a powerful piece of software. <coughs> so we, we, we mainly worked in the, the, the music industry for the first year, year or two. And we found that you know, we work with bands like U2 and, and people like Carly Minogue, um, uh, and the list goes on. And we, we, we found that there wasn't that many kind of clients that embraced the kind of, um, the, 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 the things that Massive Attack did. And uh, so we, we kind of made a conscious uh, decision to diversify. Um, so we, <coughs> We started working in different areas, such as fashion shows. This, this project was for a designer called Hamish Morrow. We designed a catwalk um, show and, and projected all these uh, virtual prints onto the, onto the models at the end of the show, which turned into actual real prints. I'm just going to whistle this. Sure, then this is a, a handy little um, heading that we found for a lot of stuff that we noticed happening. Um, on the previous show, the Hamish Morrow show, uh, we created this module that would um, uh, take camera input and then break it up into um, into triangles, which was the di the visual direction from the designer. And what we found was uh, midway through the process, we created um, we were aiming for a particular result, and we uh, obviously created some software that had some bugs in it. And I was about to fix those bugs when Matt stepped in and said, "Hang on, that's actually better than what we were aiming for." So we came up with this handy idea of letting the letting the errors sometimes come through and making the and making the art for you. Uh, so this, what you're looking at here, is um, a, an image from a, a stereo camera. This is a piece of technology that uh, takes two uh, images at the same time and then integrates them to create a three-dimensional image. It's rather like uh, if you've ever seen those beds, those beds of nails that you put your hand into and get like a relief map of, except digital. So once you've got this data set, you can render it from many different points of view, but it's collected in real time. So this here is um, an installation that we created for the chemistry gallery in Shoreditch uh, called Mirror. Where the idea is you just walk in and you see this 3D dot image of yourself. But then the viewpoint shifts, so it's as if there's a camera that's flying around you. Uh, and people actually were quite freaked out. They looked to see where this camera was, but of course that it was just a still camera hidden away. Uh, and what was interesting about this was that the, uh, the, the camera itself and the stereo process was full of errors. It, was, it was, wasn't quite quite right, you couldn't get a perfect likeness. Uh, but we decided that that was actually interesting because it gave you these very unusual images. So we kept using this technology, then we got, uh, we were asked uh, as a result of that exhibition to direct uh, a music video. So we decided to use this camera. Uh, the interesting thing here was that, um, you know, in, in music videos generally you don't get very much money and you don't get very much time. So you had like a week and a thousand pounds to make this video. So you couldn't spend money on you know, a massive shoot and, and lots of editing and rushes and that sort of thing. So we decided to use this camera. Uh, and the great advantage was that um, we could take shots from a single angle and then in post generate different camera angles because we had three-dimensional information. Uh, what was also interesting was that the, uh, the errors in the process we actually decided were interesting. So there were holes and errors in the data. And we could have cleaned them up, but we decided let's leave them in because that there's something nice about them. And for some reason, it sort of ended up going quite well with the, with, with the piece and became almost the, the, thing that, the thing that stood out. Yeah, it was the treatment for the, for the so video. So this is a bit of, I can show you a little bit of the video here.
into um, you know plot or, uh, or s- anything like that it was pretty conventional dancing chick and uh, band and uh, singer and, s- and you know those guitars and pianos but the interesting thing really was just the purely the visual treatment um, and, and and really the technique because it, it does open up the possibility in the future that as these cameras get better and better and and more and more accurate with color and things like that you'll be able to shoot really quite complicated films with a single camera that's in one location and do everything in post, as it were. Uh, so then uh, we carried on from there. There's another piece to show you based on this piece of technology, um, which is the same thing, but in a, in a live performance scenario. So we were invited to produce a performance uh, for the Rehang launch party of the at the Tate Modern. And we were um, assigned a group of acrobats to collaborate with called Mimbra. Uh, who'd been doing a performance piece that was very kind of uh, energetic and acrobatic, lots of tumbling, and we sort of thought, oh my God, it's going to be cheesy as hell. <laughs> but um, we we sort of worked with them to create this, uh, the idea of a really slow-moving human sculpture that you would we would then film with this camera and project up live on a big uh, LED screen behind them. So, and this was in the turbine hall for which they, they actually shipped in a bunch of, um, a bunch of cherry trees, um, with uh, cherry blossom trees. Uh, that they'd frozen to make sure the blossoms didn't uh, didn't fall off, but unfortunately, I think they got the timing just slightly yeah, wrong. Kind of one day, <laughs> day before the show, it was pure white, and <laughs> the day of the show, it was brown, wasn't it? They did look really good, but uh, so I'll show you a little bit of that. So, also what's interesting here is the kind of distortions that you see in the 3D shape above them. So we're spinning around it in 3D, but every now and then it'll become abstract.
so again, that was another project which we, we kind of didn't know exactly how it was going to look and feel because the screen was put up in the, on, the, on the day of the performance and, and all the lighting conditions can, can heavily affect a project like this. So <coughs> it's kind of nerve-wracking a bit. Okay, so um, in, in those projects that we've looked at previously, there's a kind of an invisible line dividing the audience and all the fun toys that you've put on the stage. Uh, we've also started to move into um, interactive works where people get to play with them. Uh, with, with, with the people actually get to touch and play and interact with the, the, the piece that you've created. Um, we've done, there's a, f a fair, uh, fair number of different types of work, but um, there's one strand which is based around video, um, which we'll show you. Um, this is um, a sort of a video experiment that involves time shifting. So this is um, a high-speed camera that can, and because it can take more frames than you normally do, it can mix them together in an interesting way to create these very fluid, time-distorted experiments where you're looking at combinations of right now and just a little while ago in the same frame. And we presented this uh, at an event for uh, Future Shorts, which is a kind of, uh, film festival, and we, we we created several of these installations, and it was it was like a kind of digital halls of hall of mirrors, and we couldn't believe how much fun people had with the piece. And this is another interesting example of you know this technology just a few years ago would have been out of our reach, uh, out of the reach of anybody trying to make this stuff, and now it's freely available. I mean, it still costs a bit, but when there when the when you do have the budget available. It's it's now feasible. And this is um, some of the footage we took of the installation in place. Yeah, this is what this is what people do when you put them in front of it. So and and this 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 general strand of work that uses this um, this camera and exp explorations of various ideas about time distortion uh, we've now <laughs> developed into um, an installation piece that is up at uh, Belsay Castle, which is a rather large castle stroke uh, stately home up in uh, Northumberland, which is used as an exhibition space. So we were given this uh, uh, this is very sort of yellow sandstone sort of appearance with lots of direct light coming from the outside. Um, and we were asked to kind of walk around and choose a room and come up with a piece. So we came up with this piece. And the idea is um, that it's a, a history mirror. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's um, an exhibition with many different artists. And I think the brief was to respond to the kind of space that you're in and uh, somehow kind of reflect the history of, of the building in, in the work. And, and as just said, it, this, is, this was kind of a, a history mirror. It, it's, it's meant to appear as a mirror. Um, it captures your uh, your every every ten seconds. It captures two seconds of your movement and slowly phases that in over your real time image. So it's it's playing with super slow motion. It's about five hundred frames a second. Mm -hmm. um, there's also um, things that appear in the room, like furniture will just appear, or people that have been in the space before. Um, so you kind of the people that have been there before, it looks really ghostly, doesn't yeah. it? <coughs> Do you want to see some? Yeah. yeah. So this has no sound. So the idea is that you sort of appear, you don't appear quite when you expect you're going to, and then you'll see fragments of your motion in slow motion. It does get some very strange reactions because people 
things that seem ordinary when you look at them in slow motion are quite unusual, strange. So there, there's moments of, of, of your own image in real time and then you'll just leave yourself playing in slow motion. And it's really interesting, especially when you interact with it, with other people, because you kind of leave behind emotions in a way and you're, you're kind of already thinking about something else. And, it's and of course, you know, the idea is that people who come in the next day will see people who've been in the, in the day before and leading in the weeks leading back to the start. It'll be a very interesting film to be made out of, <laughs> out of all the recordings when it's finished. And people had fun with kind of pretending to sit on chairs which were in the virtual space and <coughs> And or cuddling someone that was there the day before. It's quite interesting how things people do. Okay. So then there's another another kind of type of work which um, we prefer to call responsive rather than interactive, in the sense that in an interactive work the the viewer should get it in some way. They should understand what's going on and and have a kind of a, a dialogue with the work. But there's a whole another area where in fact, it started off by trying to make interactive works and then we realized that people weren't getting them and no matter how simple you made them, they would never get them or they would get them immediately and find it uninteresting. Whereas when you created a work that, that responded to you in some mysterious way, um, it wasn't necessarily clear even whether it was doing anything at all, but you'd get, um, you'd get an, a sensation that's just different from a normal in interactive experience. It was less like playing a computer game, for instance, and much more like walking into the sphere of influence of something that's alive. So um, the first project we'll show you in this heading is um, called the Monolith. Um, this is a very large slab of LED, uh, about three meters high, that is basically plonked down in the middle of uh, the courtyard space at uh, the VNA. It's called the John Majeski Garden. Uh, this was a one-night only exhibit uh, as part of uh, a group show with a lot of different artists in different parts of the building. And the brief was the same as, as the bell say really, it was to respond to the space in, in, in a way. Um, and we, we, we chose the garden because it just felt like the kind of center of the, the museum and, and everyone chose these galleries with these really intricate kind of um, designed artifacts and, and we, we, we were drawn to the garden because of the, the immense space and uh, we wanted to kind of juxtapose the very old with the very new in a way that you just don't see in the museum. And also I think what's interesting about this is the, um, the garden was remodeled with this elliptical pond which is itself quite modern, it's, it's very clean and it's, mm -hmm. you know, whereas the, the detailing up, on, up above is just a really, uh, really intricate. So uh, this sort of sits in between them. Uh, it's basically a piece of very bright LED, um, so bright it's actually very difficult to film, uh, and some very loud speakers, which were so loud they rattled the silver collection and we were told to turn them down, uh, if you didn't mind. Um, and the idea was that it would, <coughs> when you're far away from it, it would emit soothing, welcoming sounds and play nice, you know, cool colors. Then as you got closer, it would scream at you, and generally get louder and harsher until you had to step back. Um, surprisingly enough, most people didn't get that and just went right up close to it. <laughs> so it was screaming quite a lot, but it definitely was doing something, and it had it exerted a really powerful effect over over mm -hmm. people. It was a very. Uh, do we have any video? We don't have any video of it, do we? Yeah. No, not in here. Um, so, <coughs> on the success of that piece, we were contacted contacted by the VNA um, six months later to create. Uh, uh, a piece that could sit in the garden for a long, longer amount of time, um, particularly over the Christmas period. Um, so we're kind of learning from the, the aspects of uh, how people would have just approached this thing and uh, the monolith and stand in front of it. We realised that we'd, if we, if we were to make an interactive light sculpture again, we'd we have to make it so that it can it can work with, you know, larger groups of people. So we come up with this idea to create almost like a forest of, of columns which people could kind of walk into and, um, and, and, and trigger uh, an audio-visual experience. So each uh, column actually had a speaker in the top and uh, it's effectively a, a lot of monoliths but each one has separate speakers so it's a 46-channel sound system 
uh, we approached Massive Attack to create the music for it. So they created a, an eight minute piece that was divided into 46 separate channels. Uh, and the idea was that each column would play uh, its particular channel of that piece. But when you walked away from it, it would go quiet. So if there was nobody in the, in the space, the whole thing was completely black. And then as you walk up to a column, you'd hear just that column uh, playing its bit on its own. And then you'd walk to the next one, you'd hear the next instrument. But then as other people joined you, you'd hear a whole mix of sounds, depending on who was, uh, how many people there were and where they walked in the space. So you got a really complicated uh, sort of emergent pattern that came out of that. Um, this was some of the making of shots. These are all the speakers lined up in one place. So this is some of the some of the incredibly complicated system diagrams that went behind it. This was our f first um, challenge of actually manufacturing materials as well. In the past, we just would would use kind of existing technologies um, and, pres and 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 present them in, in unusual ways. But in this case, we we had to actually get the columns manufactured. Um, uh, and, uh, and that was a whole kind of new kind of world for us. Yeah. It was interesting. So these are some shots again from the warehouse. This is an overhead shot of all the LED modules. These are basically little bricks. They're about uh, about 11 centimeters across, uh, which you then which we then assembled into the columns. This is the system as it looked when we switched it on for the first time. Um, there was an immense amount of cabling and computers and um, amplifiers and power units and all kinds of wonderful things. Um, this is a shot of um, the actual uh, columns. We got the cross-section designed and they actually fabricated it at the place that we rehearsed. Uh, this is uh, one of the test patterns we put on the grid for the first time. Some shots inside the workshop where they spray-painted all the columns. And we also have uh, an interesting time-lapse video of how it, the whole thing came together. This was um, this was up at a, a warehouse in uh, Wakefield, which is a huge rehearsal space where people like Robbie Williams and uh, George Michael and various other people will build their stage sets before they go out on the road. And we were actually kicked out uh, to make way for Chris DeBerg. Interesting way to spend your time. It's great fun creating installations like this. And We'd never made anything like this before. You know, it's a real collaboration of skills. I think that the, the most difficult challenge was the audio side, really, wasn't it? C creating 46 channels um, to respond in real time. Finding a computer that could handle 46 channels without falling flat on its face. The, the actual kind of visual content within the columns was, was deliberately kind of really simple, um, just planes of colour and, and, and picking out the kind of MIDI notes um, with, with white lines falling down the columns. We wanted to design something that could, would appeal to you know, a five-year-old or you know, a seventy-five-year-old from any background. <coughs> so here, these are some pictures of it in actual operation in, in the v &A with uh, some real people getting to play with it for the first time. Yeah, the um, the m the main uh, bit of the content was 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 a it was a six minute sequence of of of, of music, much like an orchestra. But there were uh, how many interludes were there? Yeah, we had about six different uh, kind of palette cleansers where the main piece would stop, and you'd have a different uh, a different set of colors and noises. So we have a little video of the finished piece.
thought was interesting um, walking around the, the, the sculpture that the sounds are really personal each individual sound and it was fun to explore it with friends you know. in fact what you're listening to here is in, I should point out is also the sound that was taken directly from the camera so it's not a soundtrack that we added later this is really what it sounded like moving through but from a spectator's point of view it's like listening to a piece of music because um, it kind of mixes it's further away so you had these, these these two aspects, one which was very pe personal, and one more of a kind of spectator point of view. What was also interesting was that although the only thing that the only thing the system was looking at was your position, people did try all kinds of interest did try all kinds of things to figure out how they could affect the sculpture. So you'd have people jumping up and down or shaking the columns or trying to trying to play with it with their fingers to see what different things would work and what wouldn't. And it was this sort of mysterious aspect of it that I think was made it work. So this is one of the interludes we were talking about. Yeah, it's much easier to see what's going on with the interaction because there's just one person in there. But the volume would um, would increase along with the visual. So <coughs> it's obviously obviously something you have to experience yourself. <coughs> the video doesn't really show it to its best ability. This is the one we put in to weed out any people who happen to suffer from epilepsy. I mean, that, that was pretty much our most recent large piece, uh, our la most recent large commission. Um, and I guess that's all we've really got to show you. Um, we've got a lot of people working at the office, uh, which I think we should uh, talk about as well, because it's not just us two. Um, we uh, employ a mix of people. We have uh, an interaction designer from uh, the RCA. Uh, we have a couple of uh, graphic artists and animators from Ravensbourne. Uh, a couple of programmers, and we're always looking for new people. Uh, we're interested in creating a, an interdisciplinary, a multidisciplinary environment where everybody gets to put their ideas in. So, I mean, for example, James, who's a photographer there, was instrumental in improving our documentation because we realized that if you don't document a piece properly, then when it's finished, there's no evidence to ever show that you did it. Uh, so we've really started to put a lot more attention into documentation, and James is very much a, a part of that because he's into photography. So there's roles for a lot of different kinds of people. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> I guess volume is the kind of work we want to pursue, we're most interested at the moment. You know, we will continue to work in the music industry. So <coughs> it'd be interesting to um, see if any of you guys uh, fancy a work placement. We're, we're looking for um, architectural students, really, to to add that extra kind of... Yes, it's, it's slightly ironic that we're now starting to move into large-scale architectural public works, but none of us have ever <laughs> touched an architecture mm -hmm. uh, textbook. Uh, so we're definitely uh, looking for people. So that's it, really. Well, thank you very much, again, the both of you, um, for a presentation this evening. Um, I'm sure amongst you there are questions bubbling under that you would love to um, address our pair this evening.
Do we have a question at all? Yes, here's one in the front. Well, we had uh, a camera system where the camera was placed high up in the building looking straight down uh, and uh, with infrared filters. So we had uh, really strong infrared illumination, which you couldn't see, obviously, because it was just one camera really high up. Mm -hmm. We've actually been asked to show the piece in various different locations, which don't necessarily have the, the luxury of having that kind of viewpoint. So we're kind of we're thinking about the interaction technology and looking into kind of more sensor-based uh, solutions. Um. Yeah, there's various different sensor technologies that we're looking at uh, to do. There's uh, sound-based ones, there's floor-based contact ones, uh, but the camera is the simplest in a way because it's just one device. Yeah. And what kind of software were you using? To well, that's our own software. I mean, we, um, all the software use, it, we use is our own. Uh, we tend not to use other people's software. Yep, that was an LED screen. It was about 11 meters high. It's pretty big. Well, what about the, I mean, the costs of, uh, of LED? Are they, will it ever become a, this kind of technology in, uh, in a way affordable uh, or usable in uh, architectural terms? Or, I mean, is it going down? Uh, yeah, it is definitely going down. Um, there's a lot of new uh, component. There's a lot of new uh, manufacturers in China that are coming along and uh, creating cheaper LED. Although the quality in the uh, is not necessarily up to scratch yet, but it will be. It's getting better. Uh, and there's also um, a new technology which is going to become available in the next five, ten years called organic LED, which will which will allow you to effectively print very large sheets of LED at very low cost. So in fact, you won't be able to get away from it. It's actually the um, the processes of uh, the process of actually getting an image onto the LED, which we find really kind of expensive, and and it and it kind of gets in the way of a lot of installations. You know, permanent installations. People can just about afford the LED, but then they need like five processors for every kind of six panels, which cost twenty thousand pounds each. And um, but we kind of that's another area we're looking into, kind of actually um, designing our own hardware as well to kind of try and. Solve those problems. Anyone else? So is tolerance for the volume is sort of like um, I guess it has a volume aesthetic for the viewpoint and the volume for the lander. Is it is it anything you try to get get into or maybe the process of not how the shots that the LED column might start to respond to its neighbors or something further away and not kind of maybe react to that? Yeah, I mean I think you know as with all things the very much works in progress. It's not a finished piece at all. Um, and we, we tend to go for the simple things first because they're easy to, to do, first of all, but also easy to understand. Um, we had the initial, the initial plan for it was very much more complex in terms of people setting off energy waves that spread out across the, the piece and things like that. And for various reasons, um, A, because the software that, that handled the audio wasn't capable of of, of doing everything we wanted to, and also because our rehearsal time was curtailed quite severely by Christa Berg, uh, we ended up having to make it really simple. Uh, for the next one, we will be definitely exploring those things. Yeah. Any more? Any particular languages that you use for programming? Yeah, we write all our software in C++. But there, there's coders in the office that use pro processing to sketch out ideas and then we kind of translate that into our, our own software. But, but in the actual show stuff is all C++. Anyone else? And why are you looking uh, particularly to architectural students? <laughs> um, well, because they're cheap mainly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to pay anyone of course. Um, well, I think I think the, the since since volume, uh, really, we've gone into a world where where we're getting asked to produce permanent installations, um, large scale permanent installations. There are projects um, in, in Birmingham, public spaces. in public spaces. Um, uh, we've been up for quite a few projects where the other people pitching have been really large architectural lighting firms, and we've just found that 
you know, we have good ideas. It's uh, at the end of the day, it's just a screen and and you know, interesting architect, you know, interesting interaction technology. That's what we're really good at. But when it comes to the actual language that architects use to talk about spaces and usage, and uh, we find ourselves pretty much at a loss. And uh, so, not at a loss, but, not a loss, but yeah. you know, we're, we're not educated in that field, and it's it's pretty obvious to everybody that we don't speak the language. And materials as well. Yeah, yeah and materials is another thing. another really interesting area that we're trying to educate ourselves in. Um, but also I think when a, w when a work's actually a permanent work that goes into the space, there's a whole different set of things that have to be thought mm. about other than just how does it work as a piece of art. Yeah. And those are the things that we need to learn about, really. Because our, our previous work is, is so transient, you know, especially designing shows for bands. It has to be designed in such a way which is, is constructed and deconstructed in, in a matter of minutes. and. I think that's uh, in a controlled environment like a stage. You know, the public can never have to kind of really be a consideration in, in that kind of work. There's many motivations, really. I mean, part of it was just, you know, we we saw our business originally as just making shows for bands, and then we realized after working for U2 that it wasn't really something that you could build a business on just doing that. Uh, so there was a, a motivation just to diversify and to do something different. Uh, and then, you know, people people came to us and said, do you fancy doing something different? So we said, why not? Let's try it. So the opportunity was there. I don't think there was any great theoretical sense of dissatisfaction or any great theory about interaction that we wanted to express. Well, it was that, it's that kind of notion of the here and now, you know, that we got with our uh, uh, work in live performance, that experiential kind of feeling, which um, by writing our own uh, software and designing our own tools allows you to kind of work in a really interesting space, which isn't passive. And, and I think we kind of can apply that to a live show or an interactive experience. I don't think we, we kind of thought, hey, let's start designing interactive work. I think it was just a natural progression for us. And most of the interactive pieces were, were really, you know, people, people approached us to do much more kind of passive work and we were just, just trying to push the envelope a bit. And I, think also, I think we also realized that, you know, in, in the world of bands, not everybody wants the rocket science. They don't all want real-time shows that change every day. I mean, sometimes they just want the explosions here and the rain there and the fire there and that's it, you know. Most of them do. Most of them just want that. And after a while, that gets pretty pretty boring. So we thought, let's do something different. What was the, what was the motivation that the last piece of the others I think that was from learning from the monolith yeah. that this kind of one object that people would kind of <coughs> walk up to and stand around would felt was quite static in the sense that um, you know people just stood there. If and then if you made it more sculptural and people would it could explore a, sp a space that would motivate kind of movement, yeah. which is important. I mean, I think I think I think what we learned what we learned really was that. From from the first piece was that there's there's three scenarios you had to plan for. One is under load where there's nobody there at all. There's no load on the system. It still has to look good and work. And then the kind of mid range thing where you've got two or three people walking around and it's the way you envisage the interaction to work is the is the normal case that you design for. But then you also have the overload case where there's so many people that you know that things just on full the whole time. And what we realized was that you can never ensure that you don't have one of those conditions. So you have to make it work on in all those three scenarios. So it has to work as a sculpture, even when it's completely switched off, it should be cool. And then when it's so full of people that, you know, the whole thing's just on, it should still be interesting, it should still be beautiful. Um, and I think if, that, that's the key realization, I think, that came out of mm. the, the monolith piece. Mm. Any more? Any more questions? Okay then, well, thank you very much again to Ash <laughs> and Matt. Thank you.
Um, I'd just like to remind those who don't know, we still have um, until the end of the week, five o'clock on Friday, actually, um, before, as some architect speaking on Friday, uh, um, the um, Her Noise um, video archive that is in the North Jury Room, which is here, uh, which is open between 10 and 5, which is hours and hours.